Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, so over the next 10 minutes or so, I hope to find something that you all have not heard thus far in, in, our, in our presentations. So um, we did a project called, um, that was funded by a trustee professorship. It was kind of like, it was sort of pitched as being sort of a sabbatical leave, but I kind of looked at it as being like two jobs because I had my regular job and this job. But my colleagues here helped me develop a program where we went out and, and met with a bunch of different, different groups. Um, and, and so what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about this. And part of why we did this is, is if you look in the census, the census of ag would show that the Northeast, the, the agricultural system is in a, kind of in a different direction than the rest of the country. And so there's a lot of interest in agriculture and small farm agriculture, and we wanted to explore some of that. We also know that climate change is going to affect agriculture and that agriculture could reduce the impact of climate change. And so what we were, one of the things out of the bigger project we were looking for is what are farmers thinking about climate change and what kind of changes are they doing to protect soil and water resources as that's what I, that's my field of working. So what we did was we set out and um, did a 15 focus group interviews with um, different farm commodities. We did some with specifically with commodities. We did some with mixed farmer groups. We had 199 total numbers of people attend our programs. And my hope was that if we, much like, um, much like our previous speaker said, um, gave that really wonderful quote, I, my hope was that if, if people could hear the voices of what farmers are saying, that they would be tend to listen to that more than they might be if I was, for instance, giving a presentation on climate change. <laughs> and so my example is that, you know, farmers that go to other farmers' farms and say, you know, you really need to adopt this technology. I've been doing it on my farm. I, you know, I've, I've doubled milk, you know, milk per acre in my forage yields. They'll listen to that. Um, I could say you ought to adopt no-till agriculture, and they'd say, Good, okay, maybe I'll be thinking about that. So hopefully that was the idea. We taped the sessions, we transcribed them, we coded them, and we, you know, we gave them sort of positive and negative kinds of, of characteristics and ran it through in vivo and we came up with a bunch of stuff. And this, this did get published in the Journal of Agriculture, Food Systems and Community Development, um, I think last year. So if you wanna read the full paper, you can probably find it there. Um, we asked farmers first, what were you optimistic about? And farmers were by far, every single session, like a third of all the optimistic comments were around this, we were all excited about people wanting to buy local. And they think that that drive is gonna help both ag in the middle and the small farms, um, and, and as well as some of the big farms as well. So that was one of the positive things. They were also very positive about affordable land and water resources and that we have the capacity to feed a lot of people. We still have about 70 million people within a day's drive of Maine and they're, the combination of, of affordable land and a good solid water resource and this marketplace ought to really boost our agricultural production. So we thought that was pretty good. We also then of course had to ask them, well, what are you all concerned about, right? And there, the kinds of things, the increasing cost of production, that's probably expected. I'm sure you all are about to fall out of your chairs that they were concerned about too much regulation. I knew that. Only one farmer out of all of the farmers and the advisors that we talked to, only one said, are we doing enough for soil quality and soil productivity? That really surprised me. And only one concern came out from a grower before we asked the questions about, I'm concerned about the lack of predictable weather. Now this was, I, I was very shocked about that. And this is after a time of 2009 when we had nothing but the wettest summer on record and late flight and all sorts of stuff. And then 2010, I was planting mustards in my yard on St. Patrick's Day. I mean, normally there's this much snow in Maine on St. Patrick's Day. And then again in 2012. And so just the fact that we had all this weird weather and, and that, that did not elicit much more of a response than that. So that was pretty interesting. 
And so I left the feeling, and I left all of this with this feeling that farmers, yes, they adapt and they manage for risk, and, and that is what drives them, and that's why they aren't concerned about weather, because they know it's going to be weird, and they know they're just going to try to adapt. And I think that's why we ended up with that kind of response. We then, along the way, asked them a couple of more questions. We asked them, what, what kind of changes are you making on your farm with respect to fluctuating weather conditions? And we used the, those three words very specifically, because we didn't want to set anybody off. And we also asked them, what are you doing with respect to fluctuating energy prices? So those, we got a paper out on the energy prices, and we got a paper out on the weather thing. So that was kind of fun. And one of my favorite comments was this. We make ch changes all the time to whatever the situation is. In the end, I've got to have a crop to feed my cows, and I'm not trying to anticipate that next year I'm going to be in the field on May 15th. I'm going to be ready to be in the field on May 15th, but if that doesn't work, We'll get there somehow. So what that just says to me is that dairy farmers really don't care that the weather is going to, you know, they're, they're just, they're just, they just take it what comes. And so if we're going to reach them, I think we need to, to kind of appeal to that can-do spirit, will-do spirit when we talk to them about what we want them to do. And if we do it that way, I think it's going to help. We did hear a few climate denial kinds of comments when we went in and started in on this. And these are, you know, um, are not too unusual to you, I wouldn't think. Um, but, um, so, but some of these are, are, are kind of typical of what you might expect, I guess. One of the things I thought might be kind of interesting to you would be to um, show how the in vivo output looked at the different groups. And, and the one I'll focus on is this one because uh, we had apples. This was the main landscape and nursery association. I wasn't really going to do anything, anybody but farm, you know, people that grew food, but they asked me to come. I said, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll come. And then we did beef and blueberries. And it was kind of interesting that in this particular question, this group kind of separated out from the other groups. And a lot of it was related to labor, particularly with the landscape nursery people. They're always trying to find good labor. And we know apples and blueberries are always trying to find labor, and those are pretty big issues. But there were a lot of climate change-related things. And, and when you think about fruit and you think about it just dangling out there at the whim of nature, you know, you can understand that they would be talking about that. And it was some of those comments that were really the strongest about I know the climate is changing. I'm out in the field spraying my first sprays in, in apple production uh, three weeks earlier, and I've got my pesticide records to show it. And, and that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, and you know, the, some of the beepers were kind of interested in the carbon sequestration um, uh, component as well. So, so I think that's why that particular group separated out like it did. The beepers were probably the most interesting session, that was a nighttime session up in the county, and um, I went into it, and my memory was that the, the, the room had a most unusual aroma of tobacco, manure, and alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> and they were chuckling, and they were having a really good time. And, and, and so they were a little bit more open than some of the other ones. And, and they were very sensitive. They, you know, they've been reading the data. They, they're concerned about being responsible for all of this, and they, they've read this kind of, these kinds of um, exposés about them. But, um, but they were kind of fun. And, and, and you know, I, what I try to do today is try to talk to them about, well, you know, we have some systems that are really, really good. I mean, we can take marginal land. We can grow great forages. We've got a lot of water. We can convert protein, cellulose into protein and make a really good positive product. And you know, these sorts of these systems are good for water quality, and they're they're really really positive. So I think sometimes it's reaching them to what they do well and get them, uh, you know, to step back from the fears of what climate change and and perhaps in, in using some some of the data that we have learned here, I think would be really really beneficial. To go back to some of them today, our dairy farmers are um, are, are 
another interesting group. Um, they're trying to make decisions about, you know, how should we be growing longer day corn, should we be growing shorter day corn, and if we have some time, I'd like to propose that I think we ought to be looking at changing the system to more of a double crop system, as I kind of mentioned earlier today. Um, so, the, yeah, so basically the industry is telling these guys that they should grow longer corn because the seasons are getting longer. I actually disagree with that, and, and for us, we've had the coldest January through June that we've had in, in history, uh, reported like since the 1800s or something. So just because it's getting warmer somewhere doesn't necessarily going to mean it's warmer in Maine or Vermont or New Hampshire. So we should be trying to hedge our bets and reduce our risk by going with shorter season corn and maybe getting a cover crop out there to hold that nitrogen and, and protect the soils that are on the fields. Um, so that's, that was the, the point that I said earlier. Potatoes were, are another really, really interesting crop for Maine, and I really look at them as sort of the climatic Faustian bargain because they really serve to gain by it being a C3 plant. They're going to, they're going to, the productivity is going to increase as CO2 increases to a certain extent, and then it's going to crash. And so the, the models say, you know, 20 to 30 years you're going to benefit from this. And so they're like going, okay, Jameson, drive, drive to New York. Keep going, buddy. <laughs> Blow it all back here to us. Um, but in the reality, when the temperature catches up to the, to the, to the increased CO2, we're going to run into some problems. And so I, knowing that we've, we've done meetings with farmers up there, we talked about these issues, and I would have thought that we would have heard people talking about wanting a warmer climate, you know, better water efficiency, and those kinds of things. But really the kinds of things we heard were, well, okay, I think our growing season may, may be getting a little longer. It's good for yield. It's something you got to learn to manage. And I wish, on the other hand, that we would be have our growers move away from growing the long processing russet potatoes, go to something that's a shorter season potato and get some cover on those fields. Um, that would be really important. So what we didn't hear is that growers are really perceiving a risk to soil and water quality with climate change. We didn't really hear it. Um, it's not really apparent. And I think to avoid the controversial stuff, particularly fruits that, are, that you're already coming into and they're already sensitive to the issue, Talk to them about managing short-term risk. That's all I ever talk to them about. I don't care if they buy into climate change. I don't care if they, you know, if that's important to them really at all in the long term. I mean, I'd like them to think about turning off their tractors when they're just idling out there. That drives me crazy. You know, and you know, they could do a lot of things. And maybe if they had a greater appreciation, they might they might do things differently. But at least if we focus on managing short-term risk, that'll be great. And Again, try to utilize the can-do spirit um, to to adopt and motivate to the, to adopt some new land use management strategies. So that's what I wanted to talk about, and uh, our hay burners will uh, maybe our future. You just never know. Thank y'all.